dual-edged question. Does, can you change the system yourself, and does the system need to be this way? Henry looks like he's grabbing the mic. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I didn't take off any time between graduate school and postdoc, so I can't comment to that. I mean, I've been on hiring committees. You know, if there's a gap in the, the CV, people will wonder what it was. If you've got a good story for what you were doing, then it's probably not a problem. Um, you know, you, you put in the cover letter what you were doing that year and why it was interesting, and, and I imagine if it's something interesting, then it probably is not a problem. Um, as for how to change it, I think, <laughs> or what, what you could possibly do. I mean, the problem is that, that the funding agencies or the funding bodies that lead to people being supported to do math are spread around the world, and, and the people doing your stuff are also ev unevenly spread around the world. Um, I'm not sure how to fix that, save all of us living in the matrix, and then we don't have to travel. Ivan, you have some comments on this? Um, so certainly, you know, it's a question of how much time you want to take. If, if you just wanted to take a year, you might possibly be able to get a postdoc and defer it for a year or do something of that, and that's a much safer bet, you know, if you want to go and teach for a year in some, you know, school district or, you know, try something else. Uh, you know, if you go for a few years, the problem is that, you know, you're, all of the forward progress you've made in your PhD gets, you know, you kind of lose track of it, everything that's going on, people lose track of you. You know, if on the other hand, you feel like you need to kind of reset the area of math that you're working in, there are options like spending a semester or a year at one of the, you know, the NSF funded institutes, you know, MSRI for instance, and, you know, immerse yourself in something different. Um, or, you know, also you can do uh, summer internships and stuff like that. Or you could work at uh, more industrial sort of postdoc. So, you know, it's maybe it depends on the type of math, but of course Microsoft is one option. There, maybe there's still some stuff at Bell or, or some of the other uh, industry research labs have options. And that's also nice because it gives you another way of seeing how, in, how um, organizations run and seeing kind of, uh, and that can help you kind of motivate yourself to, to work harder once you see kind of a more corporate culture. Rafe, did you have a comment to add on this question? I'm, I've seen, you know, quite a lot of people over the years take time off and, you know, very, I mean, we've hired, you know, uh, at Stanford people who had taken two or three years off, I, mean, I can think of at least two cases uh, to work in the financial industry and then decided to get back into mathematics. Um, I remember actually somebody who remained nameless, but he became a well-known mathematician who uh, I was a graduate student with, became a, who was a student of Percy's, and uh, Percy Diaconis, and he uh, went off to live in a South Sea Island for a year and came back and did very well at mathematics. So, you know, anything's possible if you have the will. But I think that, you know, what Henry said is that, you know, by and large it helps to have a, uh, a good cover story, you know, <laughs> when you come back and to, to explain uh, what you do. I think that people do care about that in any time you're applying for jobs, if there's sort of a a year where it looks like you've been doing nothing, it's, uh, you know, you really have to explain that. Okay, more questions in the audience. Sorry, there's one right, there's one right here. Okay, yeah. so that one, then there was one back there and then up here. Yeah. There's one back there. Um, so my first question would be, when's the right time to have kids or is there a right time to have kids? And my second question would be that if you want to get into a new field because you feel it's interesting or it might relate to the work that you've been doing so far, but you don't speak the language, say, for example, random matrices, how do you, how do you, how do you get, get into that field and into the community? Come to PCMI. Oh, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> Let okay. me answer the second question. Um, I don't have kids yet, so. I think we're gonna split this and stick to the second question and then to the first question. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, come to these sort of summer schools is a great place and, and talk to people. Introduce yourself, tell them, you know, I'm learning, I'm interested, uh, and maybe find somebody who can mentor you and kind of point you in the direction of what you should read and, and how you should get into the field. That's While you're passing the microphone, I'll add some advice until we get to Irina. Um, switching fields, I don't think one does a huge leap for switch, but one <laughs> gradually moves is sort of the best way to do it. You know, switching from pure algebra to analysis, very far apart things might be a really bad idea. As a postdoc, you won't publish anything for a while. 
Yeah, I think there are definitely growing pains when you're switching areas. But one thing in the tr transition period, if you could find a problem that kind of bridges the two and forces you to learn the other side that you don't know very well, that is an easier transition. Yeah, so sometimes also senior people switch areas. They take a sabbatical year, the whole year, to actually learn a new subject. Um, and still, it's not switching across the you know the, the whole spectrum, but like maybe to the nearby area that where like you know the random you're working on uh, SPDs and then you switch to random matrices. Um, but some people I've heard also some people are switching completely to completely different fields and again it's the, the, it takes time so a sab sabbatical year is usually a good time for that um, but not as a postdoc yeah <laughs> okay so now we're going to tackle part two which was your first part of your question which is when and if is the right time to have kids this applies equally to men and women I will say and these days especially with more equality um, men have to think about this f a lot as well. Um. Get it back. Well, I, I can say, but I don't think there's a right time to have kids. It's I'm going to interrupt that. I mean, there isn't a wrong time, is what I was going to yeah, say. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, <laughs> yeah. But um, that, um, th there isn't a perfect time that now or never, and it just um, depends on how you feel, I think, and it's very personal. Um, it's always going to be difficult. Um, so, so you can we? Uh, your panelists are free not to say. Um, I will say for myself what I think is helpful to hear. I have two kids. One was while I was tenure track, and one was my tenure baby. So, you know, everyone said don't have a kid while tenure track. It didn't stop me. It did get me to chair a committee on maternity leave. But you know, that's a different issue. Yeah, I have uh, two boys. One was uh, a postdoc year, and then the other one tenure track. Uh, time and uh, yeah you just I, I don't know like I, I wasn't ready to give up my math and uh, but still wanted to also balance the family so I just sleep suffered basically like I slept you know slept less <laughs> still sleep very little <laughs> um, but yeah I don't, I, it, it's challenging and uh, talking to friends um, you know, sometimes you see people who do it very well, so you can ask them, you know, what's the magic formula? Yeah. I don't think there's a magic formula. <laughs> I don't think there is either. Um, I don't have children myself, um, but I have friends who are in mathematics as well as in education who do have children. And I can tell you that there are people who had children while they were in graduate school, people who had children on a postdoc, People who had children when they were pre-tenure, post-tenure. Um, so I think this answer is is the right one. You know, it's a personal choice, um, and I think it helps to have um, a really good network of support, um, including your partner, um, but other people um, to help you. And um, all the people that I'm thinking about who had these babies at different times. Um, have done very well and succeeded. So I think the one thing that I would say is that if someone tries to tell you, oh, it's a disaster to have a baby at this time, don't listen to that. To do what's best for you and your family and to get your support network in order. Um, I got to my postdoc pregnant. Um, I was told by my office mate that I should have waited until tenure. Um, but um, I think uh, I, there is a wrong time to have a baby. Don't wait, don't wait until you're after 40. It makes it much more difficult. There are a lot of issues. Uh, have a baby when you're younger. Uh, it's easier to stay up late uh, and deal with whatever is necessary. Um, you have much more energy. Uh, I think having a child also made me a more efficient person at work. Uh, you, I can't, sh okay, we didn't have internet at that time, but I, I couldn't go on Facebook or something and play all day like my friends could or whatever we were doing at that time to waste time. I had to be very efficient. Now I'm doing work so that then in the evening I can go home and play choo-choo train or whatever we were playing, right? So there's time to work efficiently and then there's time when 
you are with your child. And they're not separate. You know, there's nothing to stop you from doing math with a kid in a Bjorn at a conference. I've given a lecture with a kid there. He was sick. I couldn't leave him. So he was there. I lectured. You know, there's no wrong time. Okay, I know there's a question. Just, just one oh, quick. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So some, someone once commented to me that um, you'll always discover, it was about having children, but I think it applies to many other things. Uh, you'll discover th through, you know, having children, having to balance things, uh, the human's infinite ability to juggle. So, so you think you can't do it, but then you discover that actually you can, and that there are other things that you can't do, and then you can. And so and Henry's going to teach us how to juggle later. Uh, so there was a question back here. Yeah, hi. Um, I don't know that this is like a fully formed question, but I think I'm just curious to hear if any of you had any significant uh, mental health experiences over the course of your uh, career arc and how you sort of dealt with that, uh, managing whatever mental health difficulties you may or may not have had and how that kind of affected your productivity at work, I guess. So I will speak to this first. I think every mathematician has suffered mental health issues, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> some of these are the ups, you know, that cakewalk when you prove something, but most of that time is not. Now, um, I'm not sure if people want to speak to some specific um, or if people have experiences to share, but I can guarantee you that if you probe any group of mathematicians, people have had mental health issues. Um, you know, there are stigmas, but there are many issues, and I'm not sure if anyone wants to comment. Okay, uh, I didn't have any mental health issues in terms that I would have to go um, to a psychiatrist, but uh, when I was pregnant, I couldn't remember words. I couldn't remember how to prove a lemma that was easy for me a few months ago. I, and while I was breastfeeding, I, my words weren't coming out. I was not thinking. It was very, very difficult for me. Um, s how I got over it, I don't know. Stop breastfeeding, I don't know. <laughs> Um, some people say that uh, when they have a baby, they have this new energy. For me, it was just something happened to my brain and it wasn't there. Um, also, uh, there were times when, um, in my postdoc years at the University of Michigan, um, everybody there has um, the, um, the best teaching scores, the best research, the best babies. Their babies all slept through the night. Mine <laughs> didn't. Mine didn't. I just, it's amazing how, or that was my perception that I was at the bottom of all the ladders there, and that was very difficult, too. Um, then at some point, I said, well, they can't all be right, so I let me just live my life, and um, yeah, I think that was my experience. Down here. Um, so I actually had a fair number of health problems in graduate school. Um, I got very sick my second year. And I, I had some problems my fifth year, too, and I was incredibly depressed, basically was ready to quit, didn't want to do this anymore, I was done. Um, that's totally normal. <laughs> that's totally normal. Even into my sixth year, I was applying for postdocs. I wasn't sure that's what I wanted to do. I got to my postdoc, and I was still not quite sure that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, so I, I, well, I guess what I would say is it's normal, but that doesn't mean that you have to treat it like it's okay. Um, so, I mean, I didn't, I didn't wind up going to therapy, but I had friends who did, um, and they were really self-conscious about the fact that they were seeing a therapist, the fact that they were on antidepressants, but like, if that helps, if that makes things better, then that's what you should do. The other thing is that I think it's really easy to get wrapped up, like too wrapped up, in the department or in math. Like, not the doing of the math, but like the, the being around the same people who do math all the time and thinking that your advisor's opinion of you is your entire world and, and like this is everything, right? So get another perspective. <laughs> and if that other perspective comes from going to therapy, that is a, a great use of therapy, right? But it can also just be have friends who aren't in the department, right? Have friends who can sort of pull you out and realize, make you realize that, hey, it's okay. This isn't the end of the world. And it, I don't know, it's just really easy to get wrapped up in. And it's totally normal to want to quit. <laughs> 
all the time. <laughs> Senior mathematicians will tell you the same. This is not a phenomenon that ever ends. That's one of the things you're getting into. Um, we have time for one or two more questions. There's one right here. So um, as students and postdocs, we're taught to be great researchers, and occasionally we're taught to be OK teachers. Um, but that's only a tiny bit of being a faculty member. So what advice do you have for all of the students out there on things that you didn't know uh, coming into becoming a faculty member and things that they can work on um, as, as students and postdocs? Great question. Aside from the obvious of research and teaching, what else? Organizing PCMI? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I always say that we're very underpaid because we're, there are lots of things that we do that we're not trained to do. Being on hiring committees, for example, um, you know, companies have special people for that, and you have to learn the ropes as you go. But um, th yeah, there, there are many things um, beyond research and teaching. Um, you know, apply for grants, um, handle your co colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> D during hiring season <laughs> and so on. And, um, um, you just learn as you go, I think. Um, it's good to have role models. Um. Eric? I think um, something that happens to a lot of um, women, particularly younger women in academe, whatever the field, is that they get sort of pulled into a lot of service. Um, and so you want to try to avoid that. And so I'm appealing to everyone in this room who's going to eventually be a professor, male and female, to think about this. Don't dump all the service on um, one or two people who, are, who happen to be female or um, from ethnic minority groups. That happens as well. So I think it's important to learn how to say no. I know how to say no very charmingly. That, <laughs> that helps a lot. And when I do end up doing some service that... Um, I haven't specifically sought out, let's just say it that way. Um, I try to make sure that it's something that's really going to count and matter, um, not just to me or for me, but to the institution, something that's not just mindless um, service that's not going to have any impact. But it's important to learn how to say no. It's also important to have um, senior allies who can protect you from doing too much of this kind of service responsibility. But it is something that people don't really prepare you for, and then suddenly you get asked to be on all these committees or, or whatever it is, and you're kind of stymied as to how to handle that. Uh, I guess I would say that um, when you do get put on a committee, if you agree to it, I, I think there are ways of saying no. Sometimes that's harder to say no than others. But we, when you are on a committee, uh, especially when it comes to other people's uh, um, career and um, how they're perceived, uh, do a really good and thorough and conscientious job. Uh, it may take extra time, but you will be able to look everybody in the eye. The, the counterpoint, I don't know the solution to this problem, but the, there are certainly members of faculty who do a terrible job on committees and do a terrible job teaching, and they have tenure. And the result is that people deciding on who gets to do what say, well, do we really want to inflict this person on that class? Do we, you know, there's no point in putting them, them on that committee. So, so I guess that's not advice. <laughs> but I, I don't know what to do about this problem, but it is a problem that's, that's mm -hmm. there. So uh, th I guess two things. Uh, regarding you know, when you come to a university or when you come to any job, you know, you, you might think that there's a handbook and they tell you, you know, this is how things work. When I started at Columbia, nobody told me anything, you know, literally. I just sat in my office and I'm like, now what do I do? <laughs> and so, you know, the thing is to make friends with people, you know, colleagues who've been there a little longer, maybe not so much longer, and ask questions, you know, figure out how things work. And it takes a while. It takes a few years to really, well, it takes longer than that, to really see how things work in your university or even your department. Um, so really, you know, try to get involved, try to be a good citizen in learning about how it works so that you can make it better if, and if you have problems with it. And the other thing is, you know, a lot of time, and you know, like Brian has said, is service to the, not just your university, but to your field. And so, you know, get involved in refereeing, get involved in, in helping students, get involved in organizing stuff. And it can take a lot of time, um, so don't get too involved. But 
you know, that these are other services that are not, you know, the, the research or the, the teaching, but that, that can be very important and also very fulfilling. So I think we have time for one more. There was a question back there. While the microphone's moving back, I will amplify some of the things that were said here. I do think it's, when we get the comment. Um, Right, uh, we, uh, a couple of comments about this um, is I do believe that when you're tenure track, you really do have the right to politely say no. Um, because when you're tenure track, for many people in a research institution especially, you need to do your research. In a undergrad, primarily undergraduate institution, there is more of a service expectation usually, and you have to do great teaching, um, but you also have to leave time for your research. After that, I think there is less of a a right to be able to say no. And as Diane pointed out, there are many ways you can get around this. When you make friends with the staff, they tell you who does what. And, and it's very helpful to be friendly with the staff in these ways. So there was a question back there. Hi, uh, this is a related question, I suppose, speaking about parts of the field other than uh, research. What can you do um, maybe during grad school that might set you apart in a uh, as a hiring committee sees you, apart from being you know, the best researcher at your institution, what can you do to, say, to make them say, oh, this, this person would be a good um, fit at our institution, or um, this is somebody we'd like to have here? So this is something we unfortunately didn't get to touch on much on this panel. We'll try to do it quickly as we wrap up with this. And I will you know, point out that the answer to your question is highly dependent on the job you're applying for and what institution you're trying to head to. And we have a wide range of universities here, um, and the answer is different for each of them. So maybe we'll give each person a chance to say something about this that would be relevant for the type of institution they're currently at or were a grad student at, whichever one they prefer to. And I guess it just I mean, my experience has been that, uh, and ev not everybody has this experience, but every position that I've got was somebody knew who I was already. They knew my work. They were in a related field. Maybe I met them in a conference. So talk to people. Yeah, certainly, you know, when you're in that level, you want to go to conferences, introduce yourself, get your name out there, you know, try to do that. Also. You know, when you're in grad school, uh, one thing that I did, I was encouraged to do, it was run a seminar, a reading seminar. You know, take initiative, do that. Maybe write a review paper on something. You know, be, try to establish yourself as somebody who really knows a lot about an area um, and make sure it's clear to others that, that that's the case as well. And get a good mentor for when you're applying because ultimately it's gonna be a case-by-case -case thing. And if you don't have somebody there walking you through the process. And this is true in many ways, you know, when you get offers and stuff, if you don't have somebody there telling you, you know, wait on this one, don't take this one, you'll get, you know, pushed into something that you don't want to be doing. So I, as it's passed to Irina, for example, the cover letter going to her institution versus the cover letter going to my institution, these are two separate, completely separate things. Yes, uh, I'm at the liberal arts college, so teaching is very important for us. Um, if you have only taught recitation sections, we are not likely to look at you very carefully. So try to uh, make sure that you teach some independent course uh, without somebody telling you what's on the syllabus of this week and or uh, that you just go and solve problems. Um, we see uh, we like to see some strong teaching initiative. Uh, also, we uh, are a small department, so we are unlikely to hire people in our own area. We will we try to spread uh, research areas in the department. So just because you have friends here, that chances are you will not get in. Um, the other thing is, um, yes, we are a liberal arts institution, but every senior writes a thesis. And they all want to write a thesis about this, connecting this and that part of math. So we have to be, professors have to be generalists and be able to help these students who want to connect the disparate things. So we want to see good research for you. Just because you barely passed your PhD thesis, that's not good enough for us. You really have to have ideas for undergraduate projects and so on. What I would say is very, um, I think, education field relevant, and I think it would raise anxiety if I told you what would make you stand out in education. So I'm. I'm gonna not say that. <laughs> <laughs> I encourage you to ask Erica afterwards in private. Um, 
uh, so, so, so it is good to have a mentor who would um, help you, especially when it gets to the point when of the interview. Um, giving a good talk, a job talk, is very important. Um, a lot of people give very technical talks and uh, don't realize how many, um, y you know, the whole department is coming. They know only 10% maybe of the vocabulary that you're going to use. Um, so it's, and for a young person, it's very difficult to actually hit the right uh, level. And having a mentor who's experienced, who would, you know, listen to your talk and uh, ahead of time and uh, give you advice is very important. And also to be, well, if, if uh, people know you, uh, uh, the department know about your research, then your file is, um, has a higher chance of being picked up from the, you know, list of 400, 600 files. Um, and teaching, even uh, at a research institute, teaching is, you don't want, you know, flags to be raised by, uh, so, so someone is defending your file and someone else says, but their teaching sucks, and they gave a bad colloquium uh, talk. That actually is, makes it very difficult, even if uh, s someone is trying to defend your case, e even for them, um, it, it's going to be difficult. Um, so, yeah. So I guess I can't say a lot about hiring practices, um, but uh, I think, yeah, being knowing people, that's sort of the easiest way to, particularly if you're looking for a postdoc, if you know someone in your field that you're really interested in working with, you should, you know, reach out to them, talk to them before you apply, right? Like, don't just do it in the, the application phase. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is not really an advice about, like, what would make your application stand out, but something that's really helped me this year with putting applications together is that if you have other friends who are also applying, I would very much encourage you to sit down in a group <laughs> and actually like set aside some time every week to start getting those application materials together early and submitting them early. It makes the whole process go much, much better. Especially if you have letter writers and you want them to look at your materials before they write the letter, get it to them early. Many of your letter writers will be writing 20, 30, 40 letters in a year. Okay, you don't want to be the 35th letter they're writing. So um, I strongly encourage all of you to seek out the panelists or any other person who is here for advice. Um, if you had questions you didn't feel comfortable in public or you wanted to hear more, please, they're around. You know, you'll see them uh, this afternoon or later during the program. And please, let's give a big thanks to all the panelists.